Welcome to the inaugural First Bell Lecture on Naval Leadership and History. This new lecture series is a joint initiative between the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership and FINS. The Stockdale Center was established in 1998 and was renamed in honor of Vice Admiral James Bond Stockdale, USNA class of 1947, in 2006. For over two decades, it's been the center that served as a valuable resource for the Naval Academy and its students to empower leaders to make courageous and ethical decisions. FINS, the Forum on Integrated Naval History and Sea Power Studies, is a brand new initiative of the History Department here at the Academy. A broad understanding of the naval and military past has a direct impact on the ability of the Navy and Marine Corps to plan and operate effectively in the present and in the future. We founded FINS in order to develop our collective understanding of that naval past and to encourage collaboration in the wider field of sea power studies. We believe that the study of history is the study of applied leadership. Across naval history, leaders from the deck plates to the National Command Authority have faced shoal waters and stormy seas, and they've overcome the challenges of both wartime and peacetime. The First Bell Lecture Series brings the study of leadership, ethics, and naval history together for midshipmen, faculty, and staff, and give the opportunity to hear from leading scholars on sea power and the challenges of command, citizenship, and government. The Stockdale Center and Finns would like to thank William C. Stutt, USNA class of 1949, for his generous donation and support for this lecture series and the support of the Naval Academy Foundation. I'd also like to thank Michael McCann and Nimitz Library for hosting us today and Dr. Jeff McCreese, the Deputy Director of the Stockdale Center and his staff, uh, as, as well as Lieutenant Commander Chris Costello, the Managing Associate of FINS, for all the work they've done in helping up set up today's event. Today we're joined by Dr. Ed Meralda. Dr. Meralda is a longtime friend of the Naval Academy History Department and was Acting Director of Naval History for the U.S. Navy. And he was Senior Historian for what today we call the Navy History and Heritage Command. In 2017, the Naval Historical Foundation honored him with the Dudley W. Knox Lifetime Achievement Award. He has authored, co-authored, or edited 18 books of naval history, five of them on the U.S. Navy's experience in the Vietnam War. This includes his most recent book, released earlier this year, titled Admirals Under Fire, the U.S. Navy and the Vietnam War. In today's lecture, he's going to be discussing Leadership in Hard Times, Admiral Jim Holloway and the Post-Vietnam Navy. Dr. Meralda. Let me unmask without taking out my hearing aids, which often happens. It is a distinct honor and a pleasure for me to be here today for this inaugural session, the Bell Lecture Series in uh, Naval History and, and Leadership. I think it's, and it's part of, as Commander mentioned, part of the worthy collaboration between the Stockdale Center for Ethical Leadership and the Naval Academy History Department's uh, FINS program. I won't give the entire, repeat it again, but uh, the goal of this collaborative effort, uh, I think is especially relevant to my talk today. James L. Holloway III was one of the Navy's most prominent leaders of the 20th century. And he championed naval history. He was a longtime, lifelong champion of naval history, in addition to being a very distinguished naval leader. He was president or chairman of the board of the Naval Historical Foundation for 28 years, from 1980 to 2008. He and this is one example, he made generous donations to various projects, one in particular, digitizing the entire Dictionary of American Naval Fighting Ships, multi-volume set. Uh, he put up the cash for digitizing that very important series. And he, I worked with him on any number of projects over my time there at the Naval History Center. And. Um, the Cold War Gallery is one in particular that we were very closely aligned, the foundation and the center at the time. Uh, and part of the Cold War Gallery is still there in a separate building. You can visit as we speak. 
And uh, over my long association with Admiral Holloway, I can say that uh, he was a man of high character, high integrity, and just a warm human being as well. Mr. President, you're not going to like this. With those words, Admiral James L. Holloway told he was acting chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at that point. He told President Gerald Ford at the meeting of the National Security Council uh, that he could not support, and, and by inference, the other members of the Joint Chiefs could not support the current write-up of the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty that we were putting together for, with the Soviets. Uh, in particular, it was the fact that uh, Tomahawk land attack missiles, which were brand new at the time, it was just concept really, um, were going to be limited to 12, uh, 10 Navy ships, 10 cruisers. He said this is on set because these have, have great potential to enable the surface fleet to you know, loft uh, ammunition downrange that we haven't had in quite a while. And there were other provisions that uh, he, didn't, he didn't like and the, and the Joint Chiefs didn't like. Now, this was not uh, easily taken. Number one, President Ford was up for re-election in November, and he wanted to get this treaty signed and sealed, and he could use it as a, a uh, election tactic. Henry Kissinger was Secretary of State at the time. He was not pleased with Admiral Holloway's stand because uh, he had been involved in lim limiting to the 10 cruisers. Uh, and Secretary of Defense uh, Donald Rumsfeld was also with Henry Kissinger. So they were all displeased that the Admiral had taken this stand, but he took it. That was the important point. point. The, uh, this is one example of Holloway's lifelong uh, principled approach to leadership. Principle, character, those are very important to him throughout his career. Jim Holloway was born on the 23rd of February, 1922. And his father, Admiral James L. Holloway, Jr., was equally distinguished in his time. Four-star admiral, very much in promoting Navy education, naval education, during the 1950s. Uh, young Holloway, and the father, I guess, was posted to China at one point, Tsingtao, probably. And uh, young Holloway was a small fellow. He always was a small fellow, about five foot seven inches, and, and, and slight in weight. So he had, like Teddy Roosevelt, he had to build up his strength to tackle the world ahead of him, the challenges he'd be facing. He did that uh, to the point that when he got here to the Naval Academy, uh, he got into wrestling. And he was one of the best wrestlers this academy has ever produced. I, I think he actually was put into the Wrestling Hall of Fame at one point. So he, uh, he had tenacity, he had strength. He had a, an ability to persevere in times of adversity. That's, that's my point. In World War II, he demonstrated other qualities of leadership, coolness under fire, and courage, you know, physical courage. He was the gunner, one of the gunnery officers on board destroyer Benyon, uh, which was operating in Surigao Strait during the Battle of Leyte Gulf. Now, the destroyers were lined up on either side of the strait, you had PT boats there as well. And the Japanese Southern Fleet was coming through the strait at night. And uh, we opened up. The battleships had formed the T at the, the beginning of, or the end of the strait. They're pouring fire. But the destroyers took the, the heaviest toll at, at the early part of the battle. And Benyon is credited with sinking Japanese battleship Yamashiro, as well, well as another destroyer. So he's in the thick of it. He was a gun control director up in his perch, and for that, he earned a Bronze Star Medal. He then went on to fly F-9F Panther jets in Korea, which was a very dangerous pursuit at that point in time because it was brand new, jets were brand new to the US Navy. I don't know how many reports I read of accidents either launching or recovering F-9Fs and, and the other jet aircraft. Uh, the Navy wasn't quite ready to, to get at it, but he survived that, and he actually flew in combat. And when his commanding officer, this was a dangerous duty, was shot down and lost, uh, Jim Holloway took over as commanding officer of Fighter Squadron 52. For that, he earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. 
he had other attributes of, of leadership, intelligence and vision. Uh, one good indication of that was he could see ahead. He realized that the future in the Navy of the 1950s and 60s was going to be in naval, naval aviation, not the surface side. Um, if you, if the aircraft carrier was king because of its performance in World War II, and uh, it was definitely the Navy's capital ship during the 1950s. Almost all of the CNOs in that uh, period after World War II, not a good number were naval aviators. They had a strong hold on the position as CNO. Um, a second thing he did was he realized there was a future in nuclear power for the Navy. Hyman Rickover, the father of the nuclear Navy, was very busy with Nautilus and the other programs to develop nuclear power uh, submarines. And um, so he, Holloway said, okay, I'm going off to nuclear power school. He was there for a year. Uh, it was tough. When he first started out, the academics gave him some trouble. But typical of him, he just persevered, pushed through to such a degree that Admiral Rickover was really taken with this young officer. And he was instrumental in Holloway getting command of Enterprise, the US Navy's first nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. When that ship and her air wing went off to war in Vietnam, he was commanding officer, Jim Holloway, for two tours fighting in Operation Rolling Thunder, the bombing campaign against North Vietnam. And um, he did a great job. I mean, he, the, the ship and the air wing won all kinds of you know, battle ease, efficiency ease, and other, other plaudits for their involvement in that war. And of course, that uh, redounded to his credit as well. Now, after that, in fact, just a little aside, uh, at one point, after the first tour, he came back, and Admiral Rickover was just beside himself with happiness that the sh ship had shown so well and really stood up well for nuclear power, the importance of it. And uh, when Holloway came ashore, Rickover was there to greet him in San Francisco. And he said, OK, let's get together. I'm going to take you off for a steak dinner. Uh, well, the, the, Holloway's, or Admiral Rickover's aide said, well, sir, I think his wife wants to see him first. So they had to put off the steak dinner, but uh, it, it shows how, and another anecdote here was that uh, Rickover had a red phone installed on the bridge of Enterprise so that he could call periodically and discuss things, probably keep tabs on uh, Admiral Holloway. Holloway said, I never used it. So he never called the other direction. Sometimes he would take calls. The, um, so here, here he is a warrior again, a leader in combat. He comes back to the Pentagon, Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Air. And this is another thing that not only is a warrior and a, and a combat leader, but he's a strategic-minded problem solver and a bureaucratic wizard, if you will. He uh, developed, uh, for the first thing he did was Admiral Moore said, Thomas H. Moore was, term, was Chief of Naval Operations at that point. He said, we have had three very bad fires off Vietnam. Oriskany in 1966, Forrestal in 67, and Enterprise, his own ship, although he was no longer in command, in 69. Hundreds of sailors died and planes were destroyed and Forrestal was knocked out of business for another year. So these were serious problems for the Navy. Admiral Moore told Holloway, look, you've got to take a look at this. We need to get a handle on this. And what Holloway did, he came up with a number of solutions, studies, various procedures that were then incorporated by Navy General. And for many years afterward, they followed the guidance he had pretty much laid out based on hard data that they had gathered. Uh, that was one thing he did as a, a bureaucrat, if you will. Uh, he also developed what was called the CV concept. Rather than building up carriers for individual purposes, like anti-submarine warfare carriers, which had been the, the practice in the past, he said, this is not a good use of taxpayers' dollars. We're going to have one aircraft carrier that you know, one ship satisfies all. But the air wing can be tailored, can be customized. 
He said, if you have a carrier that's operating in the Mediterranean, where the Soviet submarine threat is the greatest fear, you need a heavy a wing, heavy in anti-submarine warfare capability. Same thing, if you're operating off Vietnam or some other place projecting naval power ashore, then you need an air wing strong in attack squadrons and fighter squadrons. Uh, that was a novel concept at that point, but again, it was adopted. The, um, he also established what was later called uh, the Nuclear Powered Carrier Program, put out a glitzy, bl glitzy, glitzy publication. It's called Everything You Ever Wanted to Know About Aircraft Carriers But Were Afraid to Ask. Sounds glib, but it, it, it sold on Capitol Hill. It's, oh, this is great, because <laughs> I had questions that were, you know, I'd like to be asked or to be answered. Um, so after a short period of time, and he's in this position, Admiral Moore and Admiral Rickover were even more enamored with his capability. Uh, they considered him the carrier czar in the Pentagon at that point. Uh, again, so impressed were his superiors that they sent him off to command the Seventh Fleet in uh, 1972. Uh, this was a plum position. You know, the Sixth Fleet and the Seventh Fleet are the two fighting fleets in the Navy then and now. And uh, he commanded the ship. He had 150 ships under his command, including six aircraft carriers uh, during the linebacker campaign of 72. Unprecedented number of carriers in one place at one time. He oversaw the mining of Haiphong Harbor, uh, the linebackers one and two campaigns, the bombing campaigns against North Vietnam. And uh, that linebacker campaign tactically or operationally was a success. Okay, we, were, we lost the war. There's no question about that. January 73, uh, the Paris Treaty got, you know, the war's over for the United States, not for our allies. And, uh, but that campaign was masterfully run. If you compare linebacker with rolling thunder, you had a greater use of technology, precision guided munitions, uh, veteran aviators, veteran sailors. I mean, the whole fleet was really, after years of war, primed and ready to fight and did a, a great job in that. Um, the, um, the ace of the world, of the war, Cunningham and Driscoll, credited with five shoot downs, the Navy's only ace of the war, two aces. And um, they did so with, with great skill. We were using Talos missiles, Terrier missiles, to go after enemy aircraft and surface targets. So that was a, a good performance of, of the Navy's swan song in Vietnam, if you will. Now he was, he so impressed everyone with his performance in that role that Admiral Elmo R. Zumwalt Jr., then the Chief of Naval Operations, said, I want you to be my second in command, my vice chief, come to Washington and work for me. Um, these, are, these two individuals were not carbon copies of each other. As most of you probably know Admiral Zumwalt. He's flamboyant, bushy eyebrows, yeah, media savvy, he had his own TV program every week. He'd send it out to the fleet, him jogging or doing something. He had a jacket with a big Z on the back of it. So Admiral Zuma was out there, if you will, socially progressive, um, and, but he was a surface Navy officer. Holloway, middle of the road, conventional guy, uh, practical, socially conservative or moderate, I guess I'd say, and a naval aviator. So two different backgrounds, two different impulses, if you will, but they worked well together as a team. Now this is only, this is the end of Zumwalt's tour. Uh, Holloway came in in 73 and Zumwalt was done in 74. But uh, Holloway served him loyally, okay? He said, I, I'm his alter ego. Whatever the CNO wants, I think I'm gonna push for that. Uh, he said, I don't have my own agenda. I'm the exec in this command. And, um, <clears throat> and one thing he did do was during his time as vice chief under Zumwalt, he had very little or no contact with Admiral Rickover because Zumwalt and Rickover hated each other. Rickover, I mean, Zumwalt tried to get Rickover fired. He didn't, didn't succeed in that. 
Uh, so there was great animosity between the two. Uh, but Holloway stayed away from that. He said, there's no need for me to get to rile things up. When he became Chief of Naval Operations, Jim Holloway, in uh, June of 1974, he had three major goals. One, rejuvenate the Navy in the wake of the Vietnam War. And the Navy had fought very well, but the Navy had some big problems, some of them caused by external uh, forces. Number two, continue Zumwalt's social revolution in regard to all kinds of things, which I'll get into, but customize them, adapt them, take what works, throw out what doesn't work, uh, tailor how we treat the social revolution in the Navy. Let's get back to a little bit more stability in that regard. And number three, prepare the Navy, the U.S. Navy, for the Soviet Navy threat, which was becoming a real concern. Admiral Zumwalt, at numerous occasions before Congress, said, if we fight the Soviets today or in a few, we're going to lose. I mean, he said that a number of times. Didn't sit well with uh, people on Capitol Hill and even in the Navy, but he said that. And it was true. The Soviet Navy had used the period after the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 to build up big time. And they were also embarked on a global reach. You had Soviet ships in the Caribbean, um, all over the world. Um, so it was a concern. He had to deal with that. The, it, with going back to number one, rejuvenating the, na the Navy after the Vietnam War, uh, that was a big, a big task. Sailors had been involved in multiple tours, much like uh, those probably here today or were involved in Afghanistan or Iraq, multiple tours overseas in combat, tropical weather, you know, hot typhoons, the rest of it. It was tough duty, 24-7 you're working out there on the ships. So sailors were tired. And the fact that we lost the war did not help morale, for sure. So the big problem that they faced was enlisting new sailors. Now remember, the draft ended in January of 1973. Uh, previously, the Navy and the Air Force had taken in people who didn't want to be in the jungles in Southeast Asia. That's gone away. So they had to get some, find some way to entice sailors to join the service. And for those lifers and others, they wanted to keep them in the service. There's the skill level that they want to maintain. The uh, <clears throat> and the Navy was definitely losing numbers of sailors. It was a major problem in, 19, in the 70s. Another factor is that this was not exclusive to the Navy, this pro these problems. This was society-wide. You had anti-war demonstrations all over the country. You had race riots in all of our major cities. Uh, you had drug abuse. You had anti-military sentiment, which is very strong at this point. So these had an impact on the Navy. Uh, there was an example. There was no raise in basic pay from 1973 to 1980. Uh, during the same time, there was a 20% inflation rate. So this is tough for sailors and uh, those in command. The next thing, Zumwalt social revolution. He, he really thought, we've got to change how we treat our sailors, our min minority sailors, but any, any sailor, on uh, their quality of service. If we're going to keep him in, if we're going to bring new people in, we've got to treat them better and do it differently. Um, you probably have heard of the 120 Z-grams, Zumwalt Z-grams. These were direct electronic communications to every sailor in the fleet. Um, in the past, some things would be passed down from Washington through the chain of command, senior officers to senior enlisted, and then on to sailors. These went really directly to everyone in the fleet. And they dealt with, and if you want to see each individual, 120, what they were, the Naval History and Heritage Command has them online. Very interesting reading, uh, if you take a look at, at them. The, um, and he talked about opening up opportunities in Z-Gram 66 for African Americans and 116 for women. Um, we need to change things. We need to open up billets for them. 
Uh, we need to stock the PXs with things that African Americans, the, the supplies they would like. Uh, we need to take all these steps. Now, he put in practice a number of programs. Human goals was one. Another was sensitivity training. In other words, you guys of both races need to learn how to get along with each other. Uh, and so they put together a lot of sessions, all Navy-wide, to do this. Um, some worked, some did not. And the criticism by a lot of senior officers, and by the way, when Zumo became CNO, he bumped over 33 other admirals to get the job. So these were not happy campers. Uh, in addition to the ZGRAM, you know, direct communication to the sailors above or bypassing them did not sit very well. But um, so a, a, a number of senior officers and senior enlisted, the lifers in the Navy, were not happy with a lot of the changes that they, they perceived as cutting them out of the action. They lost their, their command authority, if you will. So that was a problem that uh, Holloway wanted to tackle. Uh, some of the critics that the programs were amateurish or ad hoc, so most, but Admiral Gravely, um, Samuel Gravely, first African American to command a fleet, the third fleet. He complained that he was in sensitivity training where he felt like a little kid because you had some, you know, somebody brought in a civilian in many cases to give training about how to treat other people. He thought this is really childish and he, he felt it beneath him. That's just one, one explanation. Uh, but so anyway, but uh, Holloway kept a number of programs that seemed to work. And, and both Holloway and Zumwalt changed the way the Navy treated its minority sailors and its sailors in general from that point on. They both made a major contribution there. Uh, <clears throat> but Holloway wanted to return to some normalcy. He wanted to get the senior officers to think they're, they're still in command and really to beef up their responsibilities and give them that feeling. Um, he took other steps to impose greater discipline in the fleet, and he put a, a renewed emphasis on experience over youth. Admiral Zumwalt established what was called the Mod Squad. It was a TV program in the 70s where these three young Americans went out and conquered crime all by themselves. They were young and you know, energetic. And, and, you, and Zumwalt had really pushed that, you know, that youth was more important than experience. How do I pretty much turn that around? No, experience is the key here. If you've got youthful guys who are experienced, great, but um, a different approach. Um, <clears throat> another thing was the, the uniform issue. Uh, Paul F Fussell at one point said, referred to that, the uniform thing as Zumwalt's big mistake um, because they, get, they were getting rid of the bell-bottom Cracker Jack uniform, the circular white cap, um, and the complaint was that sailors and chiefs now were all looking like funeral directors. The uniforms that they were told, this is what you wear. Well, Holloway, so we're gonna turn that around. We're going back to the traditional uniforms, but we're not gonna do it overnight. It's unfair to the American taxpayer to waste all this money with all this, these uniform changes. Wait till they get worn out, the uniforms, then we'll bring it in, which is what happened. <clears throat> the, um, Another step he took was to, at Holloway, to ban alcohol being sold at officer and enlisted clubs during working hours. As a young historian at the Washington Navy Yard, I remember when that, the, the club was roaring with people <laughs> at lunchtime. They had dancers there and, uh, you know, go-go dancers and the other, it was, so he said, he put an end to that. He said, look, too many sailors coming back from lunch, half in the bag. They're asleep at their consoles. They're with machinery that could kill them or others. So he put an end to it, not during working hours. And Admiral Zumwalt had, even in one of his Z-grams, had said, we were put into the Navy more fun and zest of serving on the briny. Uh, Holloway said, well, that's, that's great, but the mission of the Navy is to fight and win wars. If it's rough duty. You're in, out there in the climate, you know, rough seas. Uh, this is not a friendly environment in many cases. So we're doing a service to the country and you, it, sometimes it's a hardship. 
fun and zest is great if you can squeeze it in, but it's not the primary uh, factor. Uh, another example, he fired the commanding officer of attack submarine Finback, who had hired a stripper named Cat Futch to entertain the sailors as the submarine went out to sea from Norfolk. She was topless. Uh, so the CO lost his job. He was trying to bring fun and zest, but it was a little bit too much. Besides personnel, <coughs> personnel issues, the fleet, the material condition of the fleet was in sad shape in this post-Vietnam period as well. 1968 to 78, ships in the fleet were reduced from 976 to 459, a drastic reduction. From 1973 to 1980, the Navy's budget was declined by 22 percent. Uh, there was limited funding for maintenance, repair, maintenance, and, and parts, if you will. Uh, Zoom, Holloway loved to tell the story of four ships that departed Norfolk headed for the Mediterranean. Three of them had to be towed back in port because they broke down and they had CAS reps. Um, he said, this is not, not satisfactory. Previously, they had hoped to rely on contractors for some maintenance things, but he said, if you're in a place like Bermuda that doesn't have a contractor and your ship breaks down, what are you going to do? The Navy's got to take care of its own. The uh, one thing that Holloway had going for him, he had an amazing ability to win friends and influence people, not only in the Navy leadership and among the sailors, but members of Congress, people with power over Navy budgets, armed services committees. Um, he was very persuasive, and he came at it very uh, suave, but he was very good at, at winning friends like that. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned already Admiral Rickover, Admiral Moore, they all sang his praises, Zumwalt even sang his praises. Um, President Nixon, although he was only in office for a short time when Holloway was CNO. He loved Holloway because he said, you're bringing the Navy back. I didn't like that Zumwalt guy. He, ru he ruined my Navy, but you're doing a good thing here. So he had Nixon's support. President Ford, other than that little fracas over uh, SALT Treaty, I liked him as well. So he, um, so he was, Admiral Holloway in general was not afraid to fight the powers that be over issues that he thought were vital. He'd stand up, he'd take fight. He, you know, his mentor, another example, Admiral Holloway, um, Admiral Rickover, had this program called an all-nuclear navy. He wanted all the capital ships of the navy, carriers, cruisers, destroyers, nuclear powered. Now here's Holloway's mentor, and Holloway got before Congress and said, uh-uh, that's not gonna fly. We cannot afford, the country cannot afford to have an all-nuclear navy. Number two, he said, my carrier was off Vietnam, and I had all kinds of conventionally powered support ships that we did just fine. So they shot it down. We don't have a, an all-nuclear Navy today. The carriers are and the submarines, but that's basically it. Um, I mentioned how he opposed Kissinger on T-LAMs and backfire bombers, another thing that did not make the SALT uh, nego negotiating terms. Uh, and the Navy said, wait a minute, these backfire bombers have great range, they're putting our fleet at risk. They need to be somehow covered in the SALT Treaty. And lastly, he took a principal stand against the Jimmy Carter, Harold Brown, who was the Secretary of Defense, uh, the Carter administration, which was basically anti-Navy. I mean, if you look at all the things that were done, uh, Carter and Brown, even though Carter was a Naval Academy graduate, had been in the Navy, served in the Navy, uh, he had no use for a Navy in this post-Vietnam period. He said, Navies tend to be interventionist. I don't like that. You know, we got into the mess in Vietnam because, you know, and Navies do that sort of thing. The only important mission for the Navy in this post-Vietnam period is to escort Army troops to Europe. Right, I mean, that that's, a very defensive-minded thinking, one-purpose thinking. And at the time, there was what was called the swing strategy. If we get into a fight with the Soviet Union, we're going to take 
most of the ships in the Pacific, shift them over to the Atlantic to ferry troops. And uh, that did not sit well with Holloway and did not sit well with most others in the U.S. Navy. The, um, <clears throat> He, and so and during this period, Holloway really became the, one of the champions of the Nimitz-class nuclear-powered carrier. He said, this is the future of the U.S. Navy. Let's get these car this class f flushed out, filled out. And of course, we know the story there. Uh, he worked with Congress, now legally, I mean, he didn't go behind the scenes, but he worked with Congress because Congress was upset. The carriers had been stripped out of DOD budgets in I think 78, 79. And on two occasions, they overrode Carter's veto of the DOD budget to get, make sure the carriers were put back in. It worked one time, it didn't work another. But he's in the fight. You know, he's trying to, and as soon as Carter left, as we know, things ch changed overnight. The, um, <clears throat> in addition to not poo pooing, but saying this, the swing strategy really doesn't work doesn't work well. It goes against everything the U.S. Navy has done over 200 years. We have an offensive mindset. Kill the archer before he lets loose his arrow. Don't wait till it's in the air. Uh, we've got to take the fight to the enemy. Um, so he reaffirmed the Navy's global mission in his own strategic plan. It's called Sea Plan 2000. Now, it never saw the light of day. It was never formally approved by the Carter administration. In fact, they said, we don't like it at all. But it was sort of the blueprint for what was done in the 1980s, the Reagan buildup of the fleet. Um, an accompanying thing that Captain Peter Schwartz, a good friend of mine and Navy strategist who was involved uh, during this period, Naval Warfare Publication 1 that Holloway issued um, said much the same thing about Sea Plan 2000. We're an offensive Navy. We need to project power ashore, we need sea control, we need a global presence to reassure our allies and to, to deter our, you know, our enemies. <clears throat> and um, this anticipated what became known as the maritime strategy of the 1980s and the 600-ship Navy. Secretary of the Navy during the Reagan administration, John Lehman, still very much active and putting out books left and right and a spokesman and a very good friend of naval history. He said that the success of these programs, maritime strategy, 600 ship Navy, owed more to Holloway than any other person. Now that's, he, so he's taking himself out of the equation, which is the, one of the first times he's done that. But um, so he's, Holloway was critical to what happened to the fleet, the positive things that happened in the 1980s. So, in conclude, Admiral James L. Holloway III's stewardship of the U.S. Navy was a model of successful leadership in times of adversity. He consistently adhered to principle, intellectual integrity, and the support of the U.S. Navy and its sailors. Thank you. <clears throat> Dr. Moritz. Yeah. Holloway before Gold War Nichols. So what was his view of the other services? Huh. Well, that's a good question. I, uh, John Lehman, of course, is very much against Goldwater Nichols. And, and, and Reagan, uh, Lehman actually worked for Holloway as a, a strategic assistant at one point. So they were close. Uh, I don't recall seeing anything where he spoke on out against uh, jointness or let's get you know, do less jointness. Just knowing his personality and the w way he worked with putting together coalitions and support groups and all that. And he operated, don't forget, the Navy was in support in Vietnam, uh, in support of the ground war. And uh, he appreciated what the services could do to help each other. Surface to, um, search and rescue in the Gulf of Tonkin was an you know, Air Force Navy thing. Um, Marines and sailors went ashore with amphibious operations in the war. So I don't recall specifically him, him saying less jointness. 
if anything, he said, we've got to work out ways to do it better. Uh, um, that would be his traditional approach. But um, I don't see he was really hired over like Laban was about gold, water, nickels, or anything like that. Yes, sir. Well, I don't think he was insubordinate. I don't think he ever did anything that was illegal or unethical. <clears throat> but he said, here's my position. Here's, these are my beliefs that we, the Navy needs to do this. The Navy is you know, put together by the US taxpayer to do this purpose. And we need to carry that out. So he always put it in a positive way. He didn't come out and say, I'm against administration policy. He just says, here's my view. And often Congress will, you know, military leaders are told, when you go before Congress, you, know, you might have to tout a line. But they also, they also know that when a congressman asks a military leader for their opinion, they want the unvarnished opinion. And he would give it. You know, he was not shy about giving that opinion. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't outright warfare, but there were really big differences of opinion, especially with Secretary of Defense uh, Harold Brown, former Air Force, I mean, Air Force uh, Chief of Staff. And he had no utility, no use for the Navy. So, but you know, he always did everything on the up and up, as far as I could see. You know. Yes, sir, Mike. Thank you, sir. Um, so, oh. following as CNO during the time when women were admitted to the service academies, did you come across anything about his views on that, or how he helped? He was, he was in favor of it, but it's curious. He didn't actually push it. He didn't propose it. It was sort of a mandate from Secretary of Defense. We're going to have women at the service academies. And he said, OK, I support that. But he didn't go out and, and take the lead, if you will. Um, and there were problems, as many of you probably know. Um, he wanted women to serve in ships other than hospital ships. But then there was the combat exclusion law which says you can't put a woman on a ship that may be getting into combat, you know, very iffy. So it, it was troubling for women to do it. The billets that he opened up, um, it turned out that they were really penalizing male sailors because they were always at sea and females were taking all the, the billets ashore. So he had to shuffle that around. I don't know the ins and outs of that, but that, that was a problem. Um, Oh, you saw the picture of uh, Rosemary Mariner, one of the first naval female naval aviators. And this is 1975. She's in a squadron. So um, incremental steps. He didn't, he, didn't go, he didn't launch a huge program like Zumwalt did or make a big notice about it. But he was working very actively to bring women into the, the service. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> Brian Kamoy from the Stockdale Center. For the 33 admirals that he kind of leapfrogged uh, to become CNO, any good stories of <laughs> causing him or undermining him? Well, I mean, there are legions of stories about that. If you look at the Naval Institute, had like a hundred volumes. They're this thick. Paul Stillwell, a colleague of mine, historian on the department for many years, and the oral historian too. Um, you've got these hundred oral histories, a lot of them on Vietnam, almost to a person. They had horror stories about Zumwalt. They didn't like him. They didn't like what he did. He had some supporters. Admiral Clary was a supporter and others. But uh, the, the admirals uh, that he jumped over, <laughs> and it wasn't just that he jumped over them. I mean, he was talented. They all knew he was brilliant. He had a vision. But the fact they thought, we paid our dues. You know, here comes this guy out of the jungles of Vietnam. That didn't help his cause because these are all aviators who did bombing operations. That stuff down in the Delta, yeah, piddly. So, you know, and Zumwalt commanded 38,000 naval personnel in Vietnam. He had a very small staff. And um, so he came to Washington. He had never commanded a numbered fleet, six fleet or seven fleet, never commanded an area fleet, St. Pac fleet or, you know, land. 
and um, so they said this guy does not have experience with a major command and how to operate with huge staffs, not just a kitchen cabinet that he had in Vietnam. Um, he tried to create his own kitchen cabinet when he took over his, in, in OPNAV. And he cut out a lot of OPNAV from the action. That didn't endear him to many people. He went for, you know, and I've, I don't want to get too much into Zoom all, but I've, if, if you get a copy of my book, <laughs> um, I get into it in a big way that um, he wanted the, uh, I lost my train of thought here. Well, he wanted, uh, Zumo was very big on youth, as I mentioned, not, not so much experience. And, and they didn't think he had enough experience to, be, to do the job. Even Holloway, now this is later on. I did two long, two, two or three days worth of oral history with Admiral Holloway. And he said that um, he wouldn't have wanted to be CNO coming the way Zumo did right out of the, you know, the jungles. Um, and it caused him problems when he was in command. So. All right, thank you, Dr. Moralda. My pleasure.